your reps are in the field every single day talking to prospects and hearing these challenges and hearing, you know, what's working and what's not. You need to give them the skill set so they can take that and then write their own messaging, write their own talk tracks. And that's how they're going to be successful. Welcome to Revenue Insights. Every week, we'll be joined by revenue leaders from some of the most successful and highest growing companies. Together, we explore how they built their revenue teams, the journeys that they've been on, and the lessons they've learned along the way. Revenue Insights is brought to you by Ebster. We're a revenue intelligence platform designed to help revenue teams to build more pipeline, close more deals, and retain more customers. Okay, so on today's episode of Revenue Insights Podcast, we're thrilled to have Sean Murray on the show. Um, Sean is a Senior Director of Sales and Sales Development at Lead IQ. Um, Sean brings a unique perspective on levering uh, technology and strategy to enhance pipeline generation. Uh, welcome, Sean. Thank you so much, Graham. Happy to be here. Super excited. Fantastic. So, Sean, you seems as though you've had quite a, a diverse career in sales and sales development across some um, multiple organizations. Can you share a bit about your journey? Yes, absolutely. So, I started my career actually a little bit different than most in the software space. I started my career in home remodeling, believe it or not. I used to sell windows, siding, roofing, doors, attic installations. So I started off there, first started off as just a sales rep where I was on a 100% commission role, right? So if I didn't sell one call close, if I didn't sell that day, I wasn't making any money, right? Quickly got promoted into a team lead role there in my second year. And then in my third year there, I got promoted into a manager role where I managed a team of 10 sales reps. So decided at year three, I'm either going to have to sell windows the rest of my life or teach people how to sell windows the rest of my life. So I decided, you know, that's not what I'm passionate about. I'm going to make a transition in careers. And I got into technology sales. It was actually a pretty rough transition. You know, it took me probably 50, 60 interviews to actually land a role in software. You know, so I was pretty persistent. Landed my first role at a company called Meltwater, starting off as a business development representative. Quickly moved up to an account executive role there within three, four months. So back in the day where, you know, SDRs were only in seat, you know, five to six months. And then moved over to Salesforce, where I had to take another step back in my career and go back to being a business development representative. Did that in the enterprise healthcare provider space. So I was on the HLS team at Salesforce, working specifically with providers, really enjoyed the healthcare space, actually, and then moved into an account executive role at Salesforce, but realized, you know, when I was BDR at Salesforce, you know, where I was spending majority of my time, I figured out how to do the job in, you know, four hours, right? So where I was spending that additional time was coaching my rep, my, uh, colleagues and my teammates and really focusing on their career de development. And that made me realize like my passion is truly in leadership. So made the transition actually to a sales development manager role over at Conga. They took a chance on me without any, so, so to speak, leadership experience in SaaS, right? Even though I was a manager at, in the home remodeling industry and figured out that's what I was passionate about. Coaching, you know, career development, really just helping others, you know, seeing other people succeed is, is what really gets me going. Back in the day, it used to be closing deals. Now it's helping people close deals is what really gets me going. And then made the transition to director of sales development over here at Lead IQ. So pretty much was tasked with rebuilding the team over here at Lead IQ from the ground up, shifting strategy, everything like that. And now I just got promoted into a senior director role of sales and sales development where I'm managing our SMB and commercial team, as well as our sales development team, inbound team and expansion team here at Lead IQ. So that so, was a long-winded answer there, Graham. No, no, that, that, that's, that's brilliant. There's a couple of questions that come out of that. So first of all, I think 
maybe you could tell our audience a little bit more about Lead IQ. Yes. So Lead IQ, we're a pipeline generation platform, right? So we're focused on bringing the highest quality data. So that's where we're heavily investing our dollars. A lot of data providers are now focusing on being a one-stop shop, a sequencing tool, a dialer, intent, you know, all of that, all of that in one tool. Whereas we are investing all of our dollars in, you know, contact data. We believe that contact data is the backbone of outreach. So you need to have you need to have accurate data in order to reach the right people, right? So not only do we have the highest quality contact data, but we also provide, you know, relevant insights that help you personalize and tailor your messaging to make sure that it's relevant so you stand out from the noise, as well as, you know, the most efficient workflows in the marketplace here today. You know, if you've got tools like Salesforce and and outreach in SalesLoft. Yeah, very often when I join companies, I'm told that they have fantastic data. Normally what they mean is they've got a fantastic volume of data, not that the data is actually, as you've pointed out, quality data. And let's be honest, exactly. data, data comes out of date so quickly. I think the the average tenure of a senior executive is anywhere between three to five years. So if you're not updating your data on a regular basis, you, you end up wasting your time because very often that guys that you thought was not senior enough, well, that was three years ago. Now he's been promoted and he is actually the one that you should be contacting. Yes, definitely, Graham. I mean, and I think it's been exasperated in the last few years. You know, there's, I'm a firm believer there's no such thing as employee or employer loyalty. So back in the day, we used to see people stay in seat, you know, for 20 years, 30 years, right? So nowadays, like you mentioned, you know, actually the statistic is that data decays 70% year over year. Wow. Right. So which attributes, you know, to close to 15% of your revenue loss. Right. So it's essential that you have the most up to date contact information. And that's how that's why Lead IQ takes, you know, the agile database approach. So we're updating our database in real time as folks are using our tools. So instead of calling a database that, you know, gets update updated every six to twelve months, right? We're actually calling our data providers and finding that contact information in real time and then updating our database. So we're taking a little bit of a different approach to data than majority of the data providers out there. Yeah, because it adds to one of the things that we do, first of all, is to actually cleanse our clients' data. Because we know very often that it's not in the shape that perhaps they're even expecting or believe. And so one of the things that we first do is to go in and cleanse their data and make sure that it is actually in good shape. The other thing that I wanted to pick up on was the fact that you spent much of the early part of your career at the business end of selling, actually doing it yourself. Do you think that that gives you a definite advantage when it comes to to training because you've not come from the sort of traditional training background? Yeah, I I totally think so. You know, I think I think when you think of the BDR role, right, you know, majority of people think, oh yeah, you know, you want to be a BDR to earn some money and make good money out of college. Yeah. Of course, everyone wants to do that, but realistically, you're doing it to build the skill set, you know, that is necessary to be successful throughout your career in software, right? This is where you're learning the foundations of how to sell. You're learning business acumen. You're learning the personas you're targeting, what they care about, their challenges, right? So if you really focus on just trying to understand business as a whole and understand what these different personas do within an organization and what they care about, you're going to be very successful and be able to, you know, position any sort of technology if you can build that business acumen. And that's where I think a lot of BDR teams make the mistake is they're trying to be, you know, pipeline engines and this this wheel that keeps on turning, right? Where I'll create the sequences for you as a BDR leader. I'll, you know, create the talk tracks for you. I'll do everything for you. And then all you have to do is this mind numbing job where you just follow tasks, right? Yeah. And that's where I think a lot of reps struggle, you know, especially getting promoted into that next level. So that's what I think is essential for building a t- the team the right way is you need to build those skill sets, right? And actually teach them, which which creates uh, an environment that allows for creativity and collaboration, right? Your reps are in the field every single day talking to prospects and hearing these challenges and hearing, you know, what's working and what's not. 
you need to give them the skill set so they can take that and then write their own messaging, write their own talk tracks. And that's how they're going to be successful. If you're setting everything up for them, not only are they going to struggle because they're going to have to do more volume, so to speak, right? Take the the volume approach rather than the quality approach, hmm. but more so they're going to struggle getting into that next role. They're not going to be able to create a point of view prior to a discovery call so they can create a compelling business case when they're talking to a client, right? So I think it's essential that teams build up those skills right? And then let your team and give your team the autonomy to go out there and trust them to do their job. A couple of questions on on that, because AI is obviously spoken about quite a lot. And whilst we all probably agree that AI can do some of the more mundane tasks very well, there is a danger sometimes that if you use AI totally for outreach, and there is no real understanding on the, on the part of the seller, of the needs, wants, and pains, particularly when you get to sea level. You know, I think sea level can spot an automated message a mile off. And I do feel as though whilst, like I say, AI can deal with some of the more mundane tasks, you talking about personas, what we found with the research that we do in our um, B2B sales benchmark report is that the top performers are not afraid to reach out to sea level because they have done that research and because they can provide a a very relevant and personal outreach message. Well, what's your your view on that? Absolutely. I mean, I think I think art of artificial intelligence, I wish I had it as a rep, right? You know, <laughs> for for things like research. Right. Yeah. So now you can compile 10Ks, news articles, podcasts, all of that information in matter of seconds, right? What used to take me 30 minutes because I I took the approach of quality over quantity my entire career. And that's how I coach my team, right? I'm all about outcomes. I don't care what your volume looks like. I care about what the results look like. Yeah. So I'm never gonna bash anyone for being efficient, right? So so I think I think the best reps are going to be even better if they leverage artificial intelligence. But I think the folks that don't understand the foundations of you know what they're doing, what they're selling, the challenges that they solve, who who are facing those challenges, why would they even care about it? Right? What where to identify business priorities, business challenges, how to find that information? Right. They're, they're going to really, really, really struggle. And they're going to just think, okay, I need to hit my number. So I'm going to use AI to write this email. Okay. I'm just going to make, you know, 150 calls today and, you know, use a generic talk track and hopefully it hits. You yeah. know? So that's what I think the mistake is right now. You're seeing auto dialers come out, right? You know, with parallel dialers that can make, you know, 200 calls a day. You know, I mean, 200 calls within an hour. Right. Yeah. And I think that's where the issue lies is like, it's not all about connects. It's about when you connect with that person, how often are you converting them? I would rather see a rep make a hundred calls a day and talk to six people and convert three out of those six, than make 500 calls a day, talk to 30 people and only convert one. Right. It's not about conversations. It's about how you're able to take that conversation and actually convert. And I think there's an argument around the damage that is done by a poor call, the damage that's done to your brand that maybe next time round they won't actually take the call because the the first call was was so poor, it wasn't relevant. I didn't actually learn anything from the call. And it was quite clear that you didn't understand my company. And I think that the damage that can be done is, yeah, it is quite significant. Yeah, I think it's really hard to come back from oftentimes, especially with the C-suite, right? So, you know, when I was coached throughout my career, everyone told me the top-down approach, right? Start at the C-suite and then work your way down, right? Because they have the most power, you know, in making a decision. And if you get them on a call, your AE is going to be happy and everything like that, right? However... I've taught my team to take the opposite approach, right? Because how I view a business is like an onion. And at the center of the onion, you've got the core problems within an organization. And the first layer 
closest to the center is going to be individual contributors. They're the ones that are actually experiencing that specific pain and those challenges day to day, right? The further you get away, next is going to be managers. They know a lot, but they're still missing a little bit because they're not in the field every single day. Then you go to directors. They know a little bit less, right? And then you go further away to C-suite. They know the least amount, right? So I have my team take a bottom up approach. I have them calling ICs and I have them calling managers, frontline managers, right? Because they're going to have those conversations. They're going to identify those challenges, right? And then we take that point of view and then we go target that C-suite. Hey, I was talking to your team. These are the challenges that they're facing. Here's how we've helped so-and-so, right? Hmm. So I think that is the right approach um, nowadays because... Look, you might only have one chance with this account when you make a cold call, right? You need to be able to convert, right? So my that's where my my team is really seeing success. I've got reps on my team that are converting 50, 60% of their connects, right? So one out of two times, they're booking a meeting. And that's solely the fact that when they're trying to book that meeting, they have that strong point of view that's relevant. Like you said, they understand the business. They understand their challenges. They understand what are the priorities right now? Where is the team focused? Because they've gathered and spent the time, especially at those upper end of the market accounts, right? When you're talking about enterprise accounts, right? You need to have that strong point of view and do your due diligence by going down. It's not going to be through, you know, research. Like you can, you can infer and you can hypothesize, right? By doing that research, but you need to hear it from the horse's mouth, right? So worst case scenario, right? Not every single time you're going to be able to talk to ICs, right? But then you've got to do your research and try to understand that business, their goals, their challenges, their their specific pain points, right? And create a relevant point of view and hypothesize what might be happening just based on similar customers and what they were experiencing. And I think that is a stronger approach you know, than just making those dials and just trying to get someone on the phone and then just pitch slapping them, so to speak. Yeah. I have to, I mean, it's an elevator ride, isn't it? Rather than parachuting straight into the C-suite, you go from the ground floor up. And as you move through those floors, you're learning each time because there is a limited amount of information on anybody's website. And no one's going to publish on their website what their major pain point is right now. No one's going to do that. The only way you're going to do that is by having a conversation with numerous people at various stages And as you say, when you arrive at C-suite, you're fully armed with the information and you know what their pain point, their needs, wants and pains are. So, uh, yeah, I applaud that approach. So when you did start at Lead IQ, interesting, what what was the, the first thing? that you did? The first thing that I did, well, first was learn, right? Like I didn't want to come in and say, I know better than you guys, Uh, right? right. Like than my team, right? Um, So I just kind of shadowed and I just took the approach of, hey, I'm learning from you guys. I want to hear how you guys are doing it and everything like that. And I understood their strategy. And when I took over the team, they were very, very focused on high volume, right? I had reps making three, 4,000 calls a, a month. You know, and that's when I that's when I I took a step back and I said, okay, you know, I'm going to just make noise here and try to make a change. Right. And I put them through a a two week enablement session to really understand the space and the personas and the challenges and customer stories. Right. I think the best reps, the best SDRs are storytellers. Right. The best sellers are storytellers. You know, I mean, especially for a company like LeadIQ, I've worked at Salesforce. Right. When you mentioned Salesforce. It's a, it's automatically you earn credibility, right? <laughs> you're, you're lucky enough to have the brand name. But when you've yeah. got Lead IQ, you need to leverage your customers, right, to to build that credibility. You're not going to build that credibility. You're just an SDR. They're going to see you as just an SDR. You're definitely not just an SDR. You are what a-, a big fundamental part of the business, right? But that's how your prospects are going to see you. So you need to tell it from the story of a customer perspective, right? So I got them a bunch of customer stories. I helped them build those those stories up so they could tell them on the phone, right? And then I and and then I took the call volume down significantly, 
I was re- I was really, really focused on objection handling. Like I said, building that point of view, making sure that they've done their research, right? And what we started to notice, right, the less calls we made, the higher conversion conversions we were starting to have, right? So last month, you know, m- my top rep made probably 385 calls, right? And hit close to 280% of his number, right? It's not about volume, you know, it's about... Can I, can, when I get someone on the, am I calling the right people first and foremost? Am I calling the right accounts, right? I mean, it all starts there. You need to make sure you're, you're picking the right accounts and calling the right prospects that are within your specific ICP, right? I think that's the first approach. I think targeting is very, very tough for a lot of SDRs when they first come in, knowing who the right person is. So if you've built that foundation with the prospecting side of things to begin with, right? Then when you get someone on the phone, it is the right person on the phone that you want to be speaking to. And you have that strong point of view. Now, there are some times, right, where you can't take that that bottom bottom up approach and you have to build that hypothesis, like we said, right? So We still want to be reaching out to those folks if we can't reach out to those lower level folks um, with that strong hypothesis. And I think that all starts with building that story and that point of view like we're talking about. But it is important to build relationships with the buying team because... Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, um, because although you may get lucky to a certain extent and that call does go through to the C-level person, but then they're going to consult with other people within the company. And if the response from them is, who? Like, never heard of this company? Then that's going to make it a little bit more difficult. But I just wanted to expand a little bit upon ICP. Because I think for a lot of companies, when they initially embrace the idea of ICP, what they see it is as a narrowing of the opportunities because we were approaching everyone and now all of a sudden we're only approaching these and that can be a little bit scary for a lot of companies. Did you get any pushback, if you like, when you decided to really laser focus on ICP? I would say, yeah, I got pushback on everything, right? You're always going to be get pushback in terms of whatever new strategies you bring to the table, right? But you've got to produce. If you're going to change the strategy, it better work, right? Or else you're out of a job, you know? So well, you're still, I, I mean, you're still tr- there. I'm still there, right? So so I trusted, I, I mean, I trusted my gut and I trusted, you know, what I knew and and I and I and I pitched it to our executive leadership. So what I did was I really took a, a hard look at our current customer base, right? And I tra- started to identify similarities. Okay. So I started to identify, okay, we work really well in the software space, but can we get even more narrow than that? You know, there's plenty of sub verticals within the software space, right? So we narrowed down to our sub vertical, right? And then we started to look at specific data points like technographic information, firmographic information, geographic information, all of that information, and started to score our accounts. And we just actually moved into a named account model from a territory model, you know? So, Due to how we're how we're building those accounts. So back to six months ago, my team would have had seven, eight thousand accounts per rep, right? And each AE would have seven or eight thousand accounts within a specific geo- geographic location. Now each rep has two to three hundred accounts. So you're talking about narrowing wow. that size, right? Yeah. And what we noticed, right? Pipeline dramatically kicked up. ACV, we're starting to close a lot more business, right? Because at the end of the day your message is not going to hit everyone. No. It's not going to, it's not going to work for every single, and some, we're in a very highly, we're in a highly competitive industry, right? We've got Zoom Info, Apollo, Seamless, like there's a bunch of different tools out there, right? So we need to focus where we know we can win, right? So we know where our data is the best and within what specific ICP, because like I said, we have an agile database. So as folks are prospecting within that specific ICP, we're getting even better and better and better data for that specific ICP, right? So when we reach out to those accounts and we get into an, a, a data test, right? We almost win every single time because we know the data is good in that space, right? Yeah. We're like, test it. You know, I know Zoom Info is a billion dollar company, but just test the data. Contact data is the backbone of outreach. You need to make sure you have accurate data, right? We get into a data test, not to mention our workflows if they have 
uh, sales loft, outreach, Salesforce, or HubSpot, right? Those workflows combined is going to get those productivity gains. But at the end of the day, you know, we have identified what accounts would be the best fit for Lead IQ by really looking at our customer base. And that's where I would recommend starting off if I was, if I was to build an account model or try to to start doing territory assignments or account assignments within my organization is take a look at your customer base. It's not about how many accounts they have because realistically, can a rep reach out to 5,000 accounts in a year? No, nor should they, right? Like yeah. it, you're going to get spam blocked. You're going to get it. You're, you're, you're not going to get the pickups, right? Your, your numbers are going to get blocked. You know, it's going to create really, it's going to look really bad on your brand, everything like that. Right. And mm. I think that's, we're talking about brand a lot, but I think that's where B2B is really moving, right? I think buyers are way more aware. Oh, yeah. So you need to have that strong brand, right? You need to be known. When they see Lead IQ, they need to think of Lead IQ as the best contact data, right? And that's what we're essentially trying to build. So I think that's, we're moving, we're seeing B2B move closer to B2C lately. These last, you know, like these last, actually since, honestly, since ChatGPT came out, that's when I started to notice the complete shift in the marketplace, you know, one in messaging, but then now, okay, you know, email's not working as well. Connect rates are down, right? How are we going to drive outbound demand, right? And that's through, you're seeing a lot of, you know, I see starting to post on LinkedIn, starting to build their personal brand, which is yep. driving prospects to that specific brand, right? So if you've got a team of sellers and SDRs that are on LinkedIn posting all the time, they, they're they seen as, you know, leaders within the industry, right? And have a really strong brand themselves, right? It's going to drive demand into your business. So you're seeing that at Gong, right? You're seeing that at Salesforce. You're seeing that at these large organizations. And I think that's where it's shifting. Yeah, uh, I totally agree. And it's interesting that when you do narrow the ICP, what happens with the, the sellers is that they become experts within that market because they're spending so much time in this narrow corridor that they naturally pick up industry news and they can bring that into the conversation rather than trying to be an expert in a wide range of industries. And I think that there's definitely an, a, an advantage there. So during your, your time at Lead IQ, you've obviously overcome some, some initial challenges, but what would you say was the, the golden moment for you at Lead IQ? You know what? I, I, what I truly believe makes a sales organization successful, right, is you need to create an environment that allows for creativity, collaboration, but most importantly, career development, mm. right? I think that's the biggest issue, you know, we're seeing in software right now. SDRs are sitting in seat for two, three years, not getting promoted into AE positions, right? And that's because they're not getting the training to be successful to be promoted into those AE roles, right? So as an SDR leader, my job is to create the talent pool for the entire organization, number one for the sales organization. But also, you know what? Not everyone's going to want to be a seller, you know, and that's okay, yeah. right? Yeah. But if you create for, create the proper training, you know, give them access to the right things, right? They're going to work hard and see because that's where a lot of leaders get it wrong. SDRs are not motivated by money. They are in a sense, right? They yeah. want to make money. But what motivates them is that career progression and that career development. So you asked the golden moment for me is setting up that career progression. And now I'm actually leading those those SDRs that became account executives on my sales team now, right? So creating that farm, I hate to say farm, mm -hmm, but yeah. farm system, right? That brings them up through the organization and think about, think about it like this, you know, in five years time, my AEs that are on my team right now that were my SDRs will be enterprise sellers. Now we've got people that have been part of Lead IQ that have lived, breathed, sold, prospected, talk to so many customers within our specific ICP selling at the enterprise level, right? That's what's going to create success within the organization, right? Is if you've got sellers that have done it from the very start, when you hire folks externally, sure, you could get, you know, a really great person that comes in and just absolutely crushes it. But from my perspective, I would rather have the person that 
I taught how to prospect. I taught how to build the point of view. I taught how to demo. I taught how to run discovery from the ground up getting promoted, right? So I think that's the golden moment for me. It was now I'm seeing, you know, my team's hustling. They're driven. They're motivated. They weren't when I took over the team because they didn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. You know, they're like, I've been here for a year. What am I going to do? Like, where am I going to go? Right. And I was like, I totally get it. You know, I would be frustrated too, right? So let's focus on making sure that you're ready for that next step. So a big part of my enablement towards their end of their career is starting to work on that skill set, right? You need to work on, they need to be able to do the job before they get into the role, right? Because when you get promoted into that position, you do have less training. I got no training when I got promoted from BDR into an account executive role at Salesforce, right? You sure you got enablement and stuff like that, but no official training. They trusted their BDR program so much that when they promoted people into the account executive program, they knew that they were going to be successful. And that's exactly what I'm trying to build here. So I'm trying to take everything that was amazing about Salesforce that I can and bring it to the organizations that I work at because you know what? They 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 know how to they know how to do things right over there and they teach their people really well and their training programs are exceptional and I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't have them so I'm trying to create that for other reps well it's interesting you should say that because our platform the the guy rubin who's the ceo and founder is very passionate about the idea to, rather than moving on your b and c players Why don't you give them the tools and the knowledge to be able to become an A player? Because we all know about the effect of a revolving door for the B and C players. You know, that becomes infectious that everyone thinks, crikey, am I going to be the next person that is asked to leave? Whereas if they actually see, as you've very eloquently pointed out, if they see that there is career progression, that you're actually going to take those B and C players show them what the A players are doing and ask them to emulate that behavior creates a completely different culture. And also, you don't have the, quite frankly, ludicrous expense of having to pay to hire new players because you you move on your B and C players and then you keep your fingers crossed that the next person coming in is going to be an A player. Sure, there's an interview process, but you never really know until day one that they're sitting in the seat. So I think that very much aligns with with our view of the world and certainly with with Guy's view of the world. Nurture those B and C players so they can become A players. Exactly. And I have a great story. You know, I had a rep that was struggling when I took over the team, right? Sat down with her, making cold calls with her for two hours. Guess what? She crushed her number the next quarter. Yeah. It's just a lot of a lot of leaders don't want to do that, right? You know, <laughs> so a lot of leaders shouldn't be in leadership, to be honest. <laughs> they think it's they think it's the next step, right? But realistically, to be candid with you, if I wanted to make more money, I'd go be an ICN, I'd go sell, I'd go be an enterprise seller. You make a hell of a lot more, more money than a, a leader does, right? So what I see, you, you, need, you have to be passionate about coaching and you have to be patient and you have to not just say, Oh, this person doesn't get it, right? Mm. If you put in the, the the effort and you give them the time and they still don't succeed, right? Then, of course, there's times to part ways with folks, yeah, right? Yeah. Some it people happens. are just not cut out for it, you know? But you, for me, I take it personally, right? Like, it's very hard for me to let people go. I get, I get very attached to my reps, right? So I'm going to do everything I can to ensure success. Now I remember I said I'm outcome focused, right? So at the end of the day, this is a sales role. You are judged by your number. You need to perform, you know, but but if I'm not doing everything I can to help them perform, then I'm not doing my job. And realistically, as a leader, they don't work for you. You work for them. If they're not successful, you're not going to be successful, right? So I think that's essential. It, It was us that hired these people. You know, as a leader, we, we went through an interview process. We had them plus a dozen other people. We had conversations with them, and we we decided, yes, this is the person for the job. If they don't, for whatever reason, work out, then I think that we need to, as leaders, take a, a, a you know a share of the blame, as it were. But I love the fact that you're so passionate about about coaching. Where where do you think that passion came from? Was it before you started? the world of work 
were you always that sort of character? Yeah, I would say so. You know, I mean, I played sports my entire life, right? So I played highly competitive basketball my my entire childhood, right? So I coached, you know, a lot of ah, uh, middle school teams. Okay. And I coached competitive teams, right? And, you know, I I was pretty good. I was decent, right? I was not going to the NBA, you know, or anything like that. But what I found was that I got more fulfillment you know, out of coaching than playing. So it's the same thing with sales, right? right? Like I I first had to prove to myself that I could do it really well, right? And then I get way more fulfillment out of coaching than actually selling, right? I don't have that. See, my wife's an enterprise seller. So whenever she sells <laughs> a deal, she runs down right. the room and, you know, and cheering like, yes, let's go. <laughs> Amazing. You know, and then when I used to close the deal, I'd be like, okay, awesome. High five, you know, but when I got someone else to clo- help someone else close a deal, I would go crazy. Right. So I found that that's, that's what kind of made me have that realization is like, okay, what, what's really driving me forward? What's going to keep me going? You know, because a lot of these, a lot of the time, you know, you're doing the same thing over and over again, right? But you've got to be passionate about it and you've got to enjoy it. Right. Or at least some aspect of the process, you know, you're not going to enjoy every part of your job, but you've got to enjoy, you know, the good parts that you enjoy, you know, in order to stay doing what you're doing. So we're almost at our time. So I just want to give you an opportunity to tell the audience where they can find a little bit more about Lead IQ. Yeah, so we host a bunch of different webinars, but just go on to leadiq.com or just feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Would love to connect with anyone. Um, Happy to chat through, you know, your prospecting strategy. I built the entire playbook here at Lead IQ. So I've got some tried and true plays that worked have worked across multiple different industries across multiple different personas that kind of are the backbone of our outreach so happy to chat through some of those plays yeah but feel free to reach out to me anytime and uh, happy to chat about lead iq or just you <laughs> okay so we will give sean's linkedin details attached to this this podcast i'm going to introduce something new sean hope you don't mind but you're going to be the first And that is, would you have a question for the next person that we interview? Bearing in mind, they're all in the same sort of space as yourself. So I know this is a bit left field, but a question that you would like the next person to answer. Yeah. I. So it's going to be a kind of a long one, right? So. We're seeing, we're seeing, you know, reply rates drop, right? Uh, a lot of times people are having to turn off email tracking because it shows, you know, report to spam, right? So you don't have open rates as a metric to really track your outreach. Connect rates are down. You're having less conversations. Where do you think outbound is heading, right? What is going to be the main driver in terms of pipeline two years, three years, four years down the road? Is it still going to be email? Is it still going to be phone? Is it still going to be LinkedIn? Is it going to be social? I'm curious what everyone's thoughts are around that. I I certainly have an opinion on that, but I'm not going to spoil it (laughs) by telling everybody what my opinion is. But yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure, Sean. I could talk to you for ages. Obviously, this is the Evsta Revenue Insights podcast. Absolute pleasure, Sean. And hopefully we can speak again soon. Definitely. Thank you, Graham. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Revenue Insights. If you want to learn more, subscribe to our newsletter and we'll deliver every episode straight to your inbox. If you have any questions, feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn. Our links will be in the episode notes. See you next week.